One of the things that I love about the purpose of the RNLI is that it's so straightforward. It is to save lives at sea, a very, very clear mission. So in order to do that, it has a fleet of lifeboats around the coast of England, Scotland, Wales, and indeed the Republic of Ireland, and also more recently has a lifeguarding service on our beaches. Yeah, my name's Rob, I'm a crew member at Pool Lifeboat Station. I've been a volunteer now on station for about three years. Within Pool Lifeboat Station, uh, there's about 30 operational volunteers. Across the country and uh, across Ireland as well, there's around 45 to 50,000 volunteers. Halfway between um, South Beach and Old Harry, over. The RNLI is, is, is an independent charity that, that is set up and exists solely to save lives at sea through lifeboats or lifeguard services, uh, but it's different from the Coast Guard, uh, Her Majesty's Coast Guard, which is a government-funded uh, organisation, uh, but we work on behalf of, shall we say, the Coast Guard when they request their assistance. When the founder of the RNLI, Sir William Hillary, first got the organisation underway, he had hoped that the government would fund life-saving around our coastline but in fact unsurprisingly the government said no. He decided that he would secure the money from the public, the general public. Mostly they did this through committees who would take on to organise events but most particularly to organise collections. Lifeboat days they were called and they had flag days in the high streets and at lifeboat stations and raised many many thousands of pounds and that carries on today. Good morning, r and headquarters. Very well, thank you. How are you? The fundraising for the r and is crucial because um, we're totally funded by donations. We're not government-aided, so all the fundraising that we do goes to run the service. Here on reception as a team, we decided we wanted to do something special for the crew because they are the most important part, the crew and the beach lifeguards. Over the years we've raised money to train a crew member. Natalie was a, a junior crew member at the pool station and we raised money to pay for a year's training for Natalie um, to enable her to become a full-time crew member, which she now is. Who here has um, mended a bicycle uh, puncher? Pretty much most of you, okay. What's one thing that we need to make sure we do before we start applying the glue? Yeah. It needs to be dry. What's the problem in our, in our situation? <laughs> We're in the middle of the ocean, okay, where there is a lot of water, so trying to get the inflation tubes dry to put the glue on is going to be pretty tricky. Most of the people who come to the Lifeboat College are actually taking their holiday leave because, of course, most of them are at work and they can't get the time off and they come down to pool and they work really, really hard, long, long days. They're often out on the water at 8 o'clock in the morning and only finish at 10 o'clock at night. Very physically demanding training, as well as very demanding on their pride, because all of them want to go back to their lifeboat station having succeeded. The training to be a lifeboat crew is quite intensive. I think the RNLI certainly prides itself on providing the best training and equipment possible for its crews. Uh, you have to learn to look after yourself and your crewmates and your boat before anything else. crews that come here to train for sea survival is we take them through a step-by-step -step procedure, get them used to the environment they potentially might be in in a real-life situation. And we talk about the two positions that might help them in a real-life situation. The first one is the help position um, and the second one is the, the group huddle situation. We then try to do a swim situation or a swim drill called the crocodile swim they can do as a group together if they had to actually swim towards a life raft in real life. Once they do the swim situation, we then get them to go to a life raft and we uh, get them to capsize and rewrite an upturned life raft. 
That in itself is very, very difficult because by that stage what they've done is they've jumped from a platform of four metres, which in itself is quite a scary prospect for some of them, and after that they'll have a fully inflated life jacket. It's very tough to be working in that environment with a big inflated life jacket for a start. At which point uh, a low pressure system starts in the, in the sea survival tank and, and waves come on and the weather starts to get a bit worse. We also lose lights as well and it starts to become dark at that stage. From that point then, they have to get themselves from the water, wet, sodden, into the life raft. Once they're in the life raft and everyone's accounted for, they then start to do the life raft procedures. Close, close the canopy, keep all the environment out, and then maintain. And that maintains the most important point. It's getting all the equipment out ready to then survive in that situation they might need to have. From there, it's things like keeping morale up by singing a song. Uh, doing whatever they can to survive by keeping lookouts and if there is any um, noises look out what they are and, and where they're coming from so they're trained then to react to any situation and throughout the evolution from there we then throw other things up and including end exercise which is a, is a helicopter rescue and we synthesize a rescue from a helicopter a SAR helicopter where we actually winch the guys up into the actual into the crane environment and then away to safety After that, they've had the experience of, of drills, but also the life raft feeling and experience. Because then, if they ever have to rescue somebody who's been in the life raft, they can then understand what it feels like for themselves as well. Sea survival training is, is really the... the the first thing you learn but the last thing you ever want to do uh, and, and you basically spend two hours looking after yourself and trying not to be sick. The training can be quite strenuous depending who you are. I so say when I came on my course here I was with a mixture of different guys. Uh, some of them find it physically strenuous, some of them mentally uh, and some of them it's completely alien. The lifeboats are very advanced now and there's a lot of things to remember um, uh, and remembering them I find quite tricky. Oh, it's a huge um, span of training. Obviously, because the people who come to our cruise come from all different walks in life, not from uh, maritime professions, as used to be the case, we've got to teach them a lot of skill about um, boat handling. We've got to teach them navigation. Uh, we've got to teach them sea survival firefighting, first aid, a huge span of courses that we teach from the Lifeboat College, which of course is supplemented back at the Lifeboat stations where they serve. There's a fire ground training at the RNLI College um, and that's basically there to, to teach how to fight fires on lifeboats. So they've got a simulator here which uh, looks like the inside of a, of a boat's engine room and bridge uh, and they set fire to it when you're in it and fill it full of smoke and flood the bottom compartment. Um, some people find it quite scary, some people find it great fun, but all throughout it you're learning whichever way, whichever way you do it. It certainly makes, it's as realistic as you can get basically without being there for real. To start with, the first six months, it was, um, it was quite scary. I used to be somebody who, who couldn't bear being woken up in the middle of the night by anything. So having a pager by your ear when it went off, you certainly knew about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's countless situations where I still don't really know what I'm doing until I'm there doing it. But thankfully, we have a lot of experienced people there to help guide you along the way. Um, but yeah, I actually got used to it quite, quite quickly. You expect what it's going to be like before you join up, I guess. But once you've done it for a year or two, it kind of just becomes second nature. Oh, <laughs> man.
Uh, I think in the last three years, just over 150 times I've been out uh, on rescues. Um, I say not all of them are rescues, quite often they're searches. Um, I say we were called out last night just to search for some reported red flares. So, so the boat was out for about two and a half hours without anything being found. So there's a lot of times we go out and there's nothing, no, nothing there at the end of the day. At any point, yeah, you can you can withdraw from the crew. You can become non-operational. Nobody wants that to happen because every lifeboat station has to have enough people of the right uh, training, background, and quality to en enable the boat to go to sea and rescue people in the worst situations at any time. So you've got to also be mindful that what you do impacts on on the station as well. If a rescue or a situation did develop at that time and somebody was to die as a result, you know, I don't think anybody would uh, would be able to live with it really. So it's, uh, it's something we try not to do at all. I'd say if anyone thinks to be a volunteer for the RNLI or, or any of the other sort of search and rescue organisations, um, you have to really think that, you have to understand that it's, it has to become a way of life after a while, that you have to want to do it all the time, and that it can be as challenging and difficult and awkward as it can be rewarding. We have a lot of, a lot of instances where we, we help people who, who perhaps could have helped themselves more, but that also has its own rewards because they tend to understand a little bit more about how they can look after themselves later on. So, so yeah, it's all, it's all give and take. And as long as you enjoy it and you've got something to give, that's the important thing.